Hello, everyone. Uh, Matt Ort here with Steve Boreen, MD, and we're going to have a fun discussion today uh, about a few topics. And so I'm really excited to have Steve with me and to have you joining us and learning about the uh, the fast pace and the the movement is moving, as we say, in America's dairy land. And it's moving both from a direct primary care standpoint, but also a direct specialty care standpoint. I've been using that terminology, DPC plus DSC. And I think it's important they go together because uh, many are familiar with the DPC model now. And, uh, but if the DPCs have to refer straight back to the hospitals, or at least maybe it's a better way to say it, don't have the opportunity to at least refer to value, known cost, known value, known accessibility, then the employer is still going to lose if they're paying all the still the over the overpriced expensive care for specialty care. So uh, we're going to get to know Steve this morning, get to know the new practice he's created called Renovo. And so I'll uh, we'll go back and forth here, Steve, but I'll, I'll turn it over you, to you if you want to introduce yourself. And, and then I'll ask you some questions to kind of bring some information out. But thank you for being here with me today. All right. Well, great. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, Matt. And thanks for for having this uh, this format available. It's uh, uh, been helpful for my partner, Josh, and I uh, to go ahead and watch what what other people are saying as well and, and a way for us to better understand the the market and the, the, the whole space. But uh, uh, just quickly about me, I'm a, I'm an anesthesiologist. I've been practicing about 20 years. Uh, the last uh, 17 have been in Wisconsin. Uh, started initially in Iowa uh, with a, a, a private practice group, and I learned, kind of cut my teeth there. Um, I learned about how uh, b business worked a little bit. Uh, we had an independent anesthesia group, independent surgeon group, independent hospitals. We kind of had three legs. We all had to negotiate with each other, and it worked really well. Um, we would go ahead and, and compete in a, a, a friendly, you know, it was fairly collegial. Um, there, there were times that we could go ahead and, and uh, uh, get something to our benefit. There are other times we had, a, had to go ahead and give give something up. And we, we really learned the art of compromise and, and patients benefited because we would go ahead and, and have schedules have, have even, even costs were, were uh, affected by that relationship. And I thought that's the way medicine was. That's what I grew. I didn't grow up with a bunch of physicians uh, uh, around me. I didn't, uh, I didn't even know there was residency after medical school until I was in, in medical school, in fact. So I, I hadn't quite done due diligence on that front. Uh, found myself in medical school um, with an idea that uh, about something that that was never going to be, I, or so I thought. Once I I got moving along, uh, my first practice, I thought finally th this is something that uh, uh, will go ahead and be like what I expected it to be. And uh, it was just in the wrong town. We were raising kids, and so we moved. And I took an employed position in Wisconsin, and I learned the other side of medicine. That's what I've been dealing with for the last 17 years, where uh, I was employed. I had other people making decisions. I wasn't able to go ahead and uh, do all the things that I wanted to do for patients. I'd uh, uh, get the angry email if I didn't do something or I did uh, uh, something differently. Sometimes it was just for recouping additional costs, doing additional tests. Um, most of the time it was, was uh, just a, a notice that they were watching. And I, I kind of felt like uh, uh, I'd lost a lot of autonomy. I didn't have an answer when patients would ask me, how much is this gonna cost? Is this how I should be doing this? Um, and part of that was I didn't know. Um, it had been shielded from me over and over. Um, I couldn't tell somebody how much one particular thing costs, except I know the hospital would tell me, well, this medication it costs $11 when we get it. And it was uh, after we took a look at uh, a, a surgery, uh, one of our own family members, when we realized that it was $140 when that medicine actually got, was, was received. And so I saw, I noticed a disconnect more and more. Um, and same thing with, with my partner, Josh, uh, jo Dr. Joshua Johnston. Um, he and I both left employed practice about five years ago and started doing some traveling work, uh, primarily in uh, Ma uh, Milwaukee area. Uh, and uh, thought maybe that that would give us some of the autonomy back, some of the different uh, 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 flexibility and ability to go ahead and take care of patients the way we wanted to. And we found we were getting the same questions and we couldn't ask, answer them. Um, how much is this going to cost? What's going on? And, and patients are really removed and so were the physicians. And it wasn't because we weren't interested. 
You know, I, I'd gone back, I got an advanced degree in healthcare delivery science. Um, I thought that that's going to be what connects me to understanding how all this works. And it, it, it frustrated me more than, more than it educated me. And uh, uh, I kept seeing more and more of these layers. And I thought, why can't I just take care of a patient? Why can't patients just come and see me or see a surgeon, um, see an endoscopist, see their family practice doc and have a relationship there? So uh, that was something that was moving with me. And Josh became familiar with the, the Free Market Medical Association then. Um, we started making trips down to go see uh, uh, the folks down at Surgery Center of Oklahoma. They were very gracious and opening things up. That's when uh, I think it was in Oklahoma or maybe it was Kansas City where Josh first uh, met you. And we found out, hey, there, there are people actually doing this in Wisconsin, too. But healthcare was set up to keep physicians from knowing that this kind of an approach is available, just like it's set up to go ahead and keep patients from, from uh, knowing it's available. And we thought, how can we fit into that? And we're anesthesiologists. So we thought procedures, uh, uh, endoscopies, uh, medical infusions, surgeries, that's the place where we can play a role in this market. And so we uh, uh, stepped back from our anesthesia practices to go ahead and, and make this our current anesthesia practice. Purchased a building, uh, was previously a surgery center. It is again, uh, needed some renovations. Uh, we had our grand opening back in, July, middle of July, so almost uh, exactly a month ago. Uh, so our, our first uh, uh, patient for a procedure uh, the very next day, and, and uh, we're doing our best to keep our, our team busy, uh, letting people know uh, uh, that we're here, we're available. We can uh, basically remove the administrative burdens of medicine, make it a more individual relationship between patients and uh, and their employer and the payer, whoever else is involved in helping facilitate that side of things and and the caregivers. And so you know, today I was I was helping clean. Today was a cleaning day. I was helping do some of the cleaning. Um, our nurse manager does much of our administrative work, but she also takes care of patients. I take care of patients. Uh, um, if you come here, the owner of the business is going to do your anesthetic. Um, and so it's it, we, we wanted to go ahead and connect that up. And it's gratifying for us as caregivers because we can take care of people the way we want. Um, in order for us to make a living, we've got to work. Um, we're we're uh, primarily paid as caregivers, whether we're nurses or techs uh, or, or, or the physicians or, or the endoscopist or the surgeon. Um, and what I, I like to tell people is every dollar that we charge a patient for a procedure uh, can be accounted for something in the room with the patient. So when the patient uh, comes into the door and they meet our receptionist, uh, well, she needs to get paid. Uh, we need electricity. We need uh, water in the building. Uh, we need insurance. Um, we need equipment. We need uh, instruments. Uh, we need medications. Uh, but other than that, it's people. It's the people who are caring for the patient. We don't have anyone who works remotely. We don't have anyone that, that doesn't touch patients or, or share a space with a patient. And that's the way medicine was 50 years ago. And that's the way I, I'm confident it'll be uh, in the future. It has to be. Yeah, I had met, um, so I had met Josh, um, I wanna say maybe as much as three years ago and. I don't know if it was Texas or where it was, but I remember, and this happens a lot, actually, if you go to an FMMA conference, there's, of course, very smart folks, right? MDs are very smart, he's, but he's he's kind of walking around very quiet, uh, and I forget how we met. We somehow got introduced, but he's just observing, right? I mean, but you know, you know, when I came down to your open house in July, talked to the radio station and the TV station, and you guys... And I and somehow it came up, I forget, but I had asked you a question. I said, do hospitals perform unnecessary surgeries? And I remember you and Josh were there and you almost in unison, you both said immediately without hesitation or reservation, you said all the time. Because <laughs> you're standing there watching it, right? You're putting the patients under. So just the notion that um, these doctors are being owned uh, and it's just interesting how how these systems can control all the even very bright people within it 
take away all their influence and decision making and use them to make a fortune. Um, but our medical autonomy in our country is being threatened both from the doctor and the patient side and everything in between. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Josh remembers that, but I just remember, and I've seen many doctors doing this, but just walking around observing, what's this about? What's this really about? Could I be doing this? And I think the wheels were turning at that time. I hadn't met you yet, but just, um, right. you know, so if we go back three years, right? I bet you there's a lot of doctors just quietly walking around right now and observing about could they start a practice. Right. And that's one of the advantages that we have. We've been in practice uh, for, for decades now in Wisconsin, Josh and I have, and we know these surgeons, we know these family practice docs. We've, we've uh, gotten to know them, some by reputation, a lot by, by direct contact. Um, and that's been important for us as we've added people to our team. Uh, not everybody's going to be the right fit. Um, not everybody's looking for this. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. I, I, I think, I, I, I think it's odd, uh, but I, I think it's fine. Everyone's got, got something different, but as we talk to people and, and what people want to do, uh, it's a real importance for this to be clinician led. Um, you talk about, uh, uh, some of the different ways that, that, uh, physicians can go ahead and interact with patients. Um, a lot of physicians you'll hear, or people will say they don't want to have anything to do with the business. Well, that's because this particular business is especially confusing and especially uh, onerous to deal with, but it doesn't have to be. And that's what we've done. We've, you know, you, we've talked a little bit. There's been, been more coming out here lately just about the, the revenue cycle mechanism of what's going on. Um, we can cut out a fair amount of that. We can, we, we can go ahead and jump to step five and we can get off at step seven. Um, we can do the same kind of business as somebody who works at Walmart, as somebody who has a flower shop or a, or a, a auto mechanic or, or a factory. We have a product and uh, we want, and it's a product that people want, and we want to share that. And so we find a fair way to go ahead and present that to people. And all they got to do is come in and buy it. And uh, we're, we're happy to do that. Uh, um, have a lot of physicians who will say, no, you must call them patients. They're not consumers or customers. Um, for me, I think it limits when, when I have a patient, uh, the idea is that you tell a patient what to do or it's their job to kind of follow. If I have a, 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 a customer, a customer is always right. And I'm convinced that the patient's always right. Uh, I won't say that somebody's non-compliant with a medication. That's something that we will hear in medicine, non-compliance. Well, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't taking a medicine. It's true that they're just not taking it in that case. Well, find a way to go ahead and bridge that gap, connect with the patient where they're at, communicate with them, and ultimately it's their choice. It's a, a free, we still have, have, have free choice here. Um, go ahead and connect with people on that level. And when physicians realize you can do that on a business level and a professional level, it changes everything. It, it turns things back to, uh, you know, you know, not, not to be, you know, overly romantic about it, but uh, um, back, back to the way it would have been generations ago. Um, it's not, so much bringing in the you know the chicken and the eggs and you know pay me I mean you can pay us with bacon we be we we find a way to go ahead and and do all that but yeah why why not but uh, it it's it's the same things that satisfy people then are what satisfy people now mm -hmm. and uh, you talked about some of the the unnecessary things uh, I remember what what came to mind and 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 maybe I've shared this with you. I had a, a gentleman who finished the marathon in a, a pretty good time. He was in his early 50s. He finished the marathon on a Sunday and he came in for a minor surgical procedure on a Tuesday. And uh, he had an EKG ordered for him. And I was there ahead of time and I told the nurse, we, we can cancel that. We don't don't need that. And uh, they're like, well, it's been ordered. I said, well, I'm I'm going to cancel it. I'm the only one who's going to see it before we go back to the case. He did a stress test. He ran a marathon. Um, I'm I'm fine. I'm comfortable that he has adequate cardiac reserve. I I don't need more information for this procedure, especially. And so they they went ahead and they canceled it. And I had three emails within an hour. Uh, the physician who ordered it actually contacted me. Uh, somebody from the cardiology department had contacted me and an administrator did. And they all wanted to know why I would cancel this test. And I said, well, it's not necessary. 
it's not going to be useful to, for anyone. It can only give me information that I, uh, I can't use. And we're going to proceed with the, the procedure either way, because I know he will tolerate this just fine. And uh, uh, we went ahead with the procedure. He did great, uh, of course. And uh, uh, there wasn't anything abnormal on the EKG when I hooked him up in the operating room either. And I had to deal with emails all the rest of the morning, people explaining to me that they have a cardiologist available and, and he's there to see patients. And if we don't keep him with enough business, we won't be able to justify him being there. Uh, the other physician who ordered it, he said, well, if I don't order this, he's over 50, I, I get a negative mark here because one of the, the routine uh, studies hasn't been done. So everybody's operating out of, you know, it seemed like penalties all over the place. And the net result, if everyone would have followed the rules, nobody would have been upset. I wouldn't have been bothered. It would have just cost the patient more. You're and just... that was kind of the answer. It wouldn't have mattered. It would have just cost him more. And that blows me away that that doesn't matter. I mean, that's a great example of what you just, you know, what we talked about. How does a system control such smart, capable people? Well, they inconvenience them and, and they nitpick them. And it's really not patient-centered, right? You were doing what was best for the patient, both financially and physically. We don't need to do an unnecessary task, test. But here they are saying, well, I need my RVUs. And, and this we have to justify this, this cardiologist being here, in, right? Not just because the patient needs them, but because of finances. Or I mean, it just, it just goes on and on. But you can see an example of the doctors within the system. They get in trouble. They get nitpick they get marks against them it hurts them financially if they don't uh, churn the, the money system so the, the cash cow right and so yeah, i think you as you start using your brain um and just simply doing what's right for the patient then you've disrupted the normal system today right and uh and another uh uh example that that uh i was reminded of is our patient zero so i mentioned our patient one that happened right after our our uh uh oh uh, our open house our, our grand opening our patient zero was before that and uh, she was a woman who uh presented for hardware removal uh, after an orthopedic procedure from a, a couple years ago she was having pain and so this, we were we were excited to get her in the operating room, and and uh, we had just remodeled our sterilization uh, area. We everybody was was all fired up, and and uh, there was a personal relationship uh, between her and one of our staff members, uh, uh, in, indirectly anyway. And uh, so uh, when she came to us and, uh, with the expectation that we were going to do this this procedure. Uh, we were going to save her more than half the cost of what the other local system had offered to do the procedure for. Well, after we set her down, we had a consultation with our orthopedic surgeon who got a little bit of extra imaging, some additional x-rays to uh, verify what we were looking at. Uh, we were able to find a non-surgical solution. And, uh, um, and, you know, that's, that's, didn't help us from a business standpoint, but it helped her tremendously. So instead of saving tens of thousands on getting the surgery with us, she saved many more. Uh, we didn't benefit directly, uh, but we gave her uh, a really good option. We've got a, a, a patient for life uh, because we, we found that non-surgical option and she's doing well without that. Now that doesn't happen in the regular system. Nobody, they schedule people they they put them into the system and it's hard to stop. And uh, uh, we want to find ways that people don't need to have the procedure. If there's another less invasive way to do that, and if that benefits them, we know that taking good care of people is going to work out for us in the end. Right. So not to get into too deep a medical here, but right. So we know, I mean, I, I'll give you a, a maybe a relatable example. I Way back when I was 19, I started a roofing company that ended up being general construction and building additions and but commonly right i would show up and the person would be like i think i need a roof can you give me an estimate and i would go of course look at the roofs have a wear factor right typically it's time 25 to 30 years and i would it was so common that i would look at the roof and i would really and it wasn't leaking in my mind it'd be like they got they got three years left five years safe left right be glad, to, be glad to put one on if they want but i'm going to tell them that and so often i would tell them that and say I, i'm glad to put a riff on i'm glad to give you an estimate but 
you don't you don't technically need one today. You can wait if you want. And but he said, well, every other roofer said I needed one today. And just kind of that thing. I'm curious. So and it, maybe it's not this simple, but let's say there's a surgery scheduled that isn't really necessary. And you know, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of variables probably with that comment, right? But let's say it's not necessary. But somehow the person's ended up in a position where they're here. Um, The, the person is scheduled for surgery, um, but what's the surgeon do when they go in then? So you put them out, but what's the surgeon, like, what's the surgeon see? Do they make a little snip here or snip here? They must do something, right? But the surgeon's got to know, like, this, this is really minor, or this wasn't really needed, or does that make sense? I don't know if that's even a fair Right. question. Well, I mean, the and the procedures, you know, and I want to be a little careful there. Uh, the procedures that are being done, they still have, uh, they still qualify for a medical indication, right? Um, that doesn't mean you couldn't, you know, uh, you know, find alternatives, physical therapy, um, uh, delay things. There aren't those other options. Uh, the surgeries that are being done, they meet the criteria of what is required, right? You know, a certain amount of pain or a certain amount of uh, um, Um, debilitation, um, uh, whatever diagnostic criteria they have, because the system is set up very good to do that. The system's the one that defined or defines even to this day what those criteria are, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you put a group of people together who benefit from doing these procedures and they decide what criteria need to be met in order to do it. They, they don't, yeah, the bar, the bar look, gets lower and lower and lower. And yeah. so um, I, when, when patients will ask, you know, do I need this procedure? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not, that's not a question that anyone but them can answer, right? Um, because it depends how it's affecting their life. Um, and they, once they meet the medical criteria, you know, we always hear about this pre-approvals and ruling things in and ruling things out. Um, the insurance companies are involved in that. Um, hospitals are involved in that. Physician groups are involved with that. Well, these are all people that benefit from people having those procedures, um, right. right? You know, um, so, so, so it, it, it's an unfair, unfair mm -hmm. position to put pa patients in. You can't have full informed consent for any of these procedures uh, without understanding the way the whole the whole system is is built in. So to to answer your question, if somebody comes in and they're dealing with knee pain, um, do they typically there will be some anomaly? Maybe it's a medial meniscus that needs you know maybe some cartilage needs. To get, there there are things that can be done. Um, oftentimes those patients will will. get some benefit. Um, they might get benefit from the local anesthetic that's that's injected at the end of the procedure. Maybe there's going to be some less inflammation. So there are some insignificant benefits that can come, uh, yeah. but there could also be another way that that benefit could have been met that didn't require surgery. And if surgery wasn't quite so expensive, people would be more interested in finding those or expensive, but yeah. also profitable. If it wasn't so profitable for these systems to go ahead and get people in the OR, we would be finding those other other options for for non-surgical care. And it could be in many cases, just like the roofs, the roofing story, right? Delay it three to five years. Well, we really don't need it now, but you might need it later. And yeah, so I think to me, mm -hmm. when you told me that story the first time, what it did was right. And it's a joke, like you call it zero now, but your first surgery. You can't. You basically didn't happen. You canceled, and you upset a lot of folks in the in the system. <laughs> and I find that hilarious. I think it's a great story because the the kind of independent surgery centers that that I like to work with and like right to to establish relationships with for the employers we support are the ones that will really tell you that. I remember when I had my tractor incident, right? My, uh, ironically, the biggest, the lasting effect is just was a slipped tendon on my, one of the fingers on my right hand. And it, it was uh, what was called boutonniere. And it was where the, the finger was like, literally, the tendon must have been pulling and was like literally going the wrong. It was kind of scaring me. And I called Keith Smith down in Oklahoma and I said, Be that if this is urgent, I'll fly, I'll drive down in a day or two or fly or whatever, you know, it, it is I need, you know, is it urgent? He said, let me put you up with a, with the right person, the right person, the surgeon called me. And then he ended up saying, um, 
I don't, you don't, there's nothing urgent here. So you're okay. I mean, we'll evaluate in the next couple of weeks, but I would recommend one of those braces. It's got a little spring on it you put on your finger. I found one, of course, me being frugal. I'm also, I'm, I'm extravagant and frugal, frugal at the same time. I'll buy like the best quality car or something, but then I'll, of course. So I spent $23 <laughs> on Amazon and I've even been known to rinse off a paper plate. So that's how frugal Mac can be. Uh, but I found a $23 um uh, brace on Amazon that ended up fixing this. Uh, I still have a little bit of swelling in that one knuckle. It's probably going to hurt later in life, but that's actually the only visible effect of being run over by a 4,000 pound tractor. But it was that, but it was that trust and I have pretty much full use. Um, and thank God for that. Um, but uh, that's, um, that was an example where what if I would have went to another surgery center, right? Would I have been having surgery? Would it have been tens of thousands of dollars? Would I even have gained anything from it? And so I think this, this, this rare case where to say, I'd love, I'd love to make money and so forth, but I, you know what, I just gotta, you know, not that they'd say that, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. You just, you don't think you need surgery. Let's try these other methods first. And so I think there's definitely a different, there's a different approach. It's patient centered versus profit centered. Mm -hmm. With these independents and and i know several like that so kudos to you for just doing what's right for the patients well I, well thank you and it well, it was interesting though because i had seen cases like that over the years and was always uh, irked by that always bothered that some of those people would end up in the operating room and uh uh then we were it was our business it, it it was a stressful thing. I really, there there was a place in my heart where I just really wanted to get this surgery in. I really wanted to to, to take care of someone. I wanted to to go right. ahead and, and, and get things moving. And I, I felt a drive to do that, unlike anything I had felt before. So I understand how that plays a role in people and that that it isn't isn't a, a purely you know, it's not an, a purely evil thing that people are trying to pu push this through, um, that it, it makes makes sense in human nature to go ahead and and, and have that push to do that. Um, but but it it takes it takes some energy to go ahead and and avoid that. And it takes a, a deliberacy and uh, a, a consistency to go ahead and say, this is this is our values. This is where where we're we're going to operate uh, uh, or, or function, not operate. In the OR sense, but in the in the functionality sense, this is where we're going to go ahead and and leave things, and it's always going to benefit the patient. Um, it's never it, it's going to only benefit us if we also benefit with the patient, and uh, it's been really gratifying, really gratifying to be able to have that approach. Yeah, the win win, right? So that patient, um, whether they, I'm not sure if. They, a person appreciates it, but right. I mean, that patients could be out there saying, this is how I was treated. I was treated with honesty and respect. And guess, I guess where they'll go if they think they need surgery again. Right. So this builds up over time. You guys are brand new. Um, so I'll, um, I'll throw some pictures in this as we go to of your, of your amazing new facility and your surgery center and infusion center, you know, right. And, and so people can see it. Uh, one of the things we haven't touched on yet is uh, that you have joined me recently as the as in the, as the co-leader of the Free Market Medical Association. So, uh, and then you're going to be sponsoring the conference. By the way, there's an amazing conference. It's not really about just hearing people speak. There's going to be some amazing speakers there, national speakers. But it's to me, it's really about driving the movement. Wisconsin is becoming or has become a model for the nation. In this free market movement. By the way, I've got my T-shirt on. I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> everyone who attends this conference will get a T-shirt like this, and a book, and a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So we're we're gonna break even concept on how we're financing the the uh, the conference. It's not meant to be a it's not an advertisement for any anything. I mean, the sponsors are there, but it's really meant to be this collaboration of driving the movement. So it's not self fund health. I've had a couple of people say, "Is this a self fund health commercial?" Actually, not at all. Uh, Cell Fund Health is a sponsor, but I promise you we won't be up there preaching that. Um, but every I will be supporting the sponsors who have paid money to make this happen. And Renova is a sponsor for that. So what was your what were your thoughts? And so I'm not sure how long you've been a part of the FMMA. Uh, but I'll, uh, my story is a little unique in that I had started what was called what we call the Healthcare Best Practice Group in Wisconsin, which started out with four people, which is around 35 growing today, 35, 3,600 people. 
And so I was more or less doing the FMMA thing. I had met them in 18. So I started using uh, SEO for surgeries, partnering with them back in 18. But I was more or less like the um, a form of the FMMA. Brian Erdman was the official FMMA yeah. leader. And then I happened to know Brian. So I had reached out and I said, I'm, I'm kind of doing this anyway. You've got the doctor side, who's the seller, if you will. And then I'm the employer background. So we have buyer and seller and they, they like to have two anyway in the state. I talked to Brian. He's like, that's awesome. Yeah, join me. And uh, so I was kind of doing the work beforehand. And then Brian recently, just more for personal decisions and Brian's mature in his career and so forth. And so decided just to step away. Um, and so you have joined me now in that. Uh, but it's really been, and so um, we'll be promoting FMMA at the conference. We'll be promoting, which is a nonprofit organization, which is over 10 years old, which is really the national link to this. But so there's a little bit about that. So Steve, what, what is your motivation for joining me in that? Right. Well, uh, yeah, I've been uh, a member for, so, you know, you said you mentioned Josh or met Josh probably three years ago. That's probably about when we started uh, talking about this, looking at trying to figure out how we'd fit in. So uh, I would be a member there for a couple of years. I hadn't ever heard of it before, right? I mean, medic medicine is set up for us not to know about that. And there isn't anything that that hasn't been either philosophically or execution wise uh, uh, completely in line with with what I'm looking for, right? You know, that that fits my own lifestyle. Um, pre free market principles. It, it makes sense. It's logical. Um, have an interest in in economics. Um, get get a chance to go ahead and 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 talk talk to my son who's studying economics. Uh, my my youngest is. Um, and and uh, then I also have another daughter who's who's an actuary. Um, so I can go ahead and 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 throw some of these concepts uh, back and forth with them, which is which has been fun too. But it, it's it's been the part of medicine that I felt like was missing, the connection with where patients are, because that should be the goal of medicine. It should be to, to heal, right? It should be to actually assist patients, meet them where they're at. And that can't be done with just medications and procedures. There's something else. And that's something that a lot of family practice doctors, certainly uh, direct pay uh, clinics will, will go ahead and and uh, be a draw for them. Sometimes for, as specialists, we we don't get credit for that, I think quite as much, um, but it's more gratifying for me than it ever has been. Um, and that's something that FMAMA uh, uh, connects up to me. It, it's the bridge between the, the part of medicine that I can't do when I'm just taking care of a patient medically and it connects that up with that medical care. So, so it's it's doing the things that that allow healthcare to happen in in a reasonable way, in a fair way, in a transparent way, in a way that people understand. Just like if they're purchasing anything else, and they have value, and and by by including them in the the, the equation, uh, they're they're more interested. Mm -hmm. uh, they want they want to play a role. It turns out that people are pretty smart. And that people are interested in what's going on with their lives. And we, we talk about people who are, are making poor choices. There are some reasons that they're doing that. A lot of them know that it's not a great choice um, to do, you know, maybe maybe their weight, maybe maybe they're, they're smoking. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, lecturing them right. and, and keeping them separate from, from the consequences of that isn't helping. Um, we 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 don't do that with with anyone else, and we look as I mentioned earlier. Well, when we talk about patient care, we we direct we we tell patients what to do. We don't ask patients what they want. Um, if if I go into a store and somebody tells me you should get this, uh, unless I have a relationship with them and there's some other basis for that, I'm not going to be pleased with that. But if they can educate me and include me. I'm going to feel more more comfortable with the purchase, and I'm going to be more excited about it. And healthcare shouldn't be different, uh, because people have that that drive already. They care about themselves. They, their family members care about them. And right now, the economy is such that things are not great. It's 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 a big deal with the the size of of copays and deductibles. People are really affected by what's happening with healthcare. 
And to go ahead and be able to bridge that, that's the part of medicine that isn't working here right now. Um, and it can, it can simply. And FMMA is, is right right at the, the lead of that, making it available. I know uh, they're getting uh, uh, med students, residents are, are being included more and more in, in the process. Um, that's life-changing for those careers. That's career-changing and life-changing for, for those patients. Uh, and, and there's no way that that can't, be where where this movement and all of healthcare follows. We're going to have uh, seven or eight medical students at the upcoming conference in August 28th and 29th, the Don't Feed the Beast conference I mentioned. So it's yeah, if you listen to those medical students, um, they'll tell you this wasn't the way even 30 years ago. I've talked to Dr. Grace Torres Hodges, and she said you know it's very common to go to an independent, but it it's all changed over the last two or three decades where they've kind of formed your path. The object and the goal of the FMMA is to say really that the free market, free market is in economics, as you mentioned, is the really the only solution. We believe it's really the only way to solve this problem. Why do I say that? Why does FMMA believe that? One is because this isn't a problem for the for the sellers. Some of the some of them value added, some of them not value added in lean terms. Uh, but they're all getting wealthy, the seller side. The employers and their employees on the commercial side are the buyers of healthcare. The sellers are all getting very wealthy. So it's not a problem for them. So if anyone is waiting, if you're an employer or you're a patient for an employee, employer, a part of an employer plan, if you're waiting for them to solve this problem, you're going to be waiting a while because it's not a problem for them. You don't fix something if it's not a problem. So that's part of it. We also can't go into their world from the outside and change their world or fix their so-called problems. Then you could say, well, what about the government side? No, to each his own. And I'm not against some possible regulation or price limits or something, but I would say so far, uh, if we look at other government systems, and this is a whole other discussion, but we're at 20% of GDP, which is a huge number for the United States of America. Um, and it used to be before COVID, euthanasia was the sixth leading cause of death. It's my understanding now in Canada that it's the third leading cause of death. Um, we need to confirm those stats, but that's what I was told recently by someone. And so those are things are true. And then so, so a lot of Surgery Center of Oklahoma's customers are coming down from Canada because they're waiting, having to wait a year or two for surgeries. The same with Italy. Italy's uh, um, folks from Italy are flying over mm -hmm. to have surgery in America. So that now now, is our, but those are at the independent, free market-minded surgery centers. They're not going to the hospitals. They're going to these affordable, transparent. And so we believe that when you open up this market and we break these monopolies that have been formed, that the consumer has a true choice. They have to have the plan design has to change and they have to have a true choice. But would you want to spend $20,000 for a joint replacement that's better quality than the one that's 80? I would. And so that has better outcomes as a 90 day warranty in many cases and so forth. And so, and we believe, so then if they lose revenue, that's the idea of don't feed the beast. If they lose revenue, the monopoly ones now, they will be forced to either not exist just like a healthy free market, or they will change their ways and have to share prices and bundle surgeries and, and have, um, and just have good services overall. It's the same as you take a simple restaurant. If a restaurant doesn't serve their customers and get enough and have them coming back for fair prices and great food and so forth, uh, they won't be around. We've seen that all over, right? Restaurants come and go. And that's the same thing we need for healthcare uh, to have to, to fight to get the prices as low as possible, but to keep the quality as high as possible. And that's what the free market FMA is all about. Right. I think I, I, I think that's a great point. Uh, I think buyers don't recognize the power they have. I mean, you, you should everywhere else, right? And collectively, especially, um, you go ahead and and nothing, not you can't force somebody to buy something uh, if, if if there are options out there, right? I mean, people have to choose to buy something, and uh, if if you're smart with that as a, as an employer, employer group, um, and 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 use the tools that are available, whatever it is. I mean, when they're buying raw materials, when 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 the steel company they they didn't 
sit there and 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 decide where they were going to get the the steel from and and leave it to one person that was on the team no the the whole team got together top to bottom and they said this is a better vendor for us we're going to go ahead and work out the deal with them they knew to the penny and and to the pound I and mean, they're dealing in 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 tons but they knew to the pound how much everything was going to cost and they got that into the, uh, the inner fabric of everything that they did yet people will sit back and and let somebody else deal with the healthcare, which is their net expense. If it's not the second, it's the third highest expense in their company. And they can go ahead and make a difference and everything's going to rain back in because most doctors I know would, would like to make a, a, a fair living and take good care of people, right? I mean, those, those, are, those are the things that, that you want to do. You want to be challenged, uh, there, there's lots, lots of benefit. It's a real blessing to be able to, to have that kind of an interaction with, with patients. Um, and most of us, that's what we're doing or what we would like to be doing. Um, and the reason we've got burnout, the reason there's moral hazard, the reason people are so excited, I've got countless physicians that are, that they can't wait for, for 10 of us, uh, 10 of our place to open in Wisconsin. And there should be, there should be 500 or a thousand places like us. Um, you there. It, you should have every every broker out there should be able to to connect people up with with uh, a, a plan that that's fair and transparent. It'll make their job easier. Every 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 health system ought to be able to to a health delivery system ought to be able to do that. And I agree. I think when hospitals see, I mean, the idea is that people follow. What, what we're doing. We're not, we're certainly not leading the way we're following other people. We're, we're just, you know, in the, the early part of the train, we're certainly not the engine. Um, but the caboose is, you know, not, not even been built yet. It, the whole process is going to move on through uh, because it'll give those employers an opportunity to stay in business. It's going to give uh, employees an opportunity to go ahead and control what they're doing, what they're paying. Um, I, I just don't see the downside. And uh, uh, all the people who are working in the middle, I mean, the downside is is somebody who just uh, is making money in, in healthcare uh, from a private equity standpoint, right? You know, that there, we want to go ahead and limit that. If you want to make your, your money in private equity, you better have something unique. You better have something that's going to actually contribute to, to the process. Um, you can't just add another layer. Um, and that was, uh, you know, I was just, uh, reminded uh, um, Dean uh, Jargo at, at uh, um, uh, Fair Market Health uh, uh, just reminded me of uh, a quote, one of my all-time favorite quotes, and there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently uh, that which should not be done at all, right? I mean, I think that was Peter Drucker um, said that, you know, great, it doesn't matter how efficiently you do something, if you shouldn't be doing it at all, um, mm -hmm. you're you're making a mistake. So these are the things that these are brilliant people on all these levels that can go ahead and find their niche. Um, but we need to go ahead and, and stop doing all these uh, uh, non-disclosure agreements, all this back backroom deals um, under the table, not see what's going, going on. Uh, this should be a simple, transparent process. And that's how we have it at our website. People go to that just like just like at SEO. Uh, go to our website. You can you pick your procedure and see your price it's that simple and and it doesn't cost more than that that's it that's the whole thing it's included and for those uh, ceos and cfos or uh, even this uh, everyday consumer of healthcare like you and me right it's this brainwash that we've that we've kind of been brainwashed to say what does the card cover we don't purchase anything else like that because mm -hmm. this year's planning costs or next year's premium increases so even if your card covers well if you don't look at the total price, your premiums are going to go up, which is still up money out of your pocket. Uh, so we really need to treat healthcare like we treat every other area of the business. And uh, healthcare uh, is, they've kind of shut a lot of this down. We're opening it back up in Wisconsin and other states are as well. Uh, healthcare is shoppable and we should be shopping for value in healthcare services instead of this generic view of these benefits and they're all the same. And if we cut dollars, will have to cut benefits is, abso is absolutely a myth. Uh, when you start shopping wisely for healthcare, you pay what you're supposed to for healthcare and in almost all cases, you get better healthcare. Uh, so it's, it's, the, it's what you and I would have our, this bang your head here sign in the wall. I used to have this target that you would just post to the wall and it says bang head here. 
I put that in my book, um, where this becomes so obvious. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, but yet we watch employers, it's kind of they spend a month, they look at a maybe a conflicted advisor or something. Uh, that's fading, I think. We're changing the way advisors think. We're having many come over to the side. Uh, but they make these quick decisions and they write these big, big checks. And it's catching up. It's catching up with American families. It's catching up with American employers. And uh, it's going to eat our lunch if we don't do something about it. Right. I think, uh, um, I don't know if you've mentioned anything about the, it's not personal, it's just healthcare uh, 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 documentary. Um, actually, and, and, I actually did. I did some uh, clips for that, but I ended up. Uh, right. I don't know if you'd mentioned anything on 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 no. this format no. with this, but no. uh, um, you know that I always I've been encouraging more and more people to go and watch watch that. You know where they can see mm -hmm. all, all 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 kinds of experts uh, uh, speaking in and contributing there. So uh, um, then just I think that's that's worth making uh you know kind of that reminder to people that that's a, a real useful resource a, a good uh wake 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 up for for people or or just something to uh, be annoyed by um but uh also enthused by what what it means when people are looking into that so i think it's worth making sure that that's available on uh, that people are continually reminded on every format and yes. uh, i know that education so the mm -hmm. education of organizations we used to trust that are no longer trustworthy and so we mm -hmm. should always be a little bit skeptical so mm -hmm. steve um, um as we kind of close here i appreciate your time today very valuable discussion renovo health how can people find you and how can they utilize your services sure uh great yeah thanks uh thanks matt for the opportunity and it's always a pleasure uh, and, and thanks for all the work that you've been doing and, and lots of people have been doing for, for many years that made it available. You know, the foundation has been set. Josh and I couldn't have done this even a couple of years ago, certainly not five or 10 years ago, um, because there's there was no awareness. Uh, nobody. We still run into all sorts of people that say, how on earth do we do this? And yeah. and when we give them the simple answer, um, they, they can't believe it. But to have other resources around FMMA um and and your book the you know videos and and lots of other people doing the same thing in the the same market moving moving things in the right direction um so thanks for that um our website is the easiest way to get in touch with us and see everything it's our our who we are our story our mission our values um it's also got our, our procedure list as well as all the all the prices for them that's at uh, www.renovo health.care so r e n o v o health.care um and we have a uh, uh, phone phone number is listed on that um uh email everything is is really easy we've got a, a place for uh, secure email transmission as well if anyone had any any uh, uh health related questions that they wanted to relay in that uh, um but we're, we're easy to find uh, we're uh, uh, on on Facebook as well. Uh, we we will uh, uh, make it as easy as possible, and uh, you know they can they can look me up. You can probably even find me in the phone book somewhere. So uh, and so one more thing, and then we'll we'll close her out. So what kind of I know you're going to be increasing this as you go, but could you give some examples of the services that you sure. that you offer at, at right. Transparent Right yeah, Bundle? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yes, we've uh, got orthopedic surgery. Uh, we're not doing total joint procedures. There are a lot of people that are that are in the market doing a nice job with that. That's something that we uh, look into uh, 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 proceeding towards down the, down the line. Uh, but uh, knee scopes, uh, uh, shoulder scopes, and all the associated procedures that go along with that, carpal tunnels, uh, um, uh, uh, if you get your, your boutonniere that needs to get worked on, uh, we can go ahead and, and, and do that repair. Uh, also, uh, gynecology, uh, all, you know, full service gynecologic care um, and uh, uh, endoscopy services. So colonoscopies and EGDs, that's been one thing that's been real popular uh, for us, made a, uh, given us a lot of attention uh, uh, under $3,000 for a colonoscopy. My, my tagline is all, always uh, a polyps included uh, to the point that I think I'm going to uh, maybe get to dress up as a polyp for Halloween 
um, uh, based on the staff's re response here. So all the pathology will identify a polyp, we'll remove it, and we'll get it to the pathologist and report. You probably can't buy that custom with the store. You probably have it's, to custom make that. No, it, it, there's actually one available. And the, oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you don't want to look it up. Uh, don't look it up at work. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. and, uh, uh, so that's, that's been something that, that certainly gets people's attention. Uh, the problem that patients will have, uh, or employers, whoever's paying is going to have is if you come in for a screening colonoscopy and somebody finds a, a, a polyp, uh, it changes the entire coding and you could very easily double or triple the cost of the procedure. And well, for us, still, it's you're it, still asleep. You're under anesthesia mm -hmm. and your costs right. are just yeah. Yep. And your your five thousand dollar bill just became twelve thousand uh, dollars, and uh, so for us it's three thousand uh, dollars. It does cost us more to remove polyps, um, but we can go ahead. We have that built in. We know how often, and working with our endoscopists, we know how often uh, they come up, and so we've done some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis about where to figure prices in, and we've we've calculated that all in. It does cost hundreds more, but it doesn't cost thousands and certainly not 10,000 more to go ahead and deal with that. And that's the risk that we're willing to accept. Um, and uh, uh, that's that's been been a, a real draw for us. And we also have medical infusions. We don't make any money off the medication. Our whole, our whole process is I didn't uh, develop the medication. Josh didn't market the medication. Nobody in our team uh, is, is making money off the medication. If we can get the medicine, and and uh, at, a, at a lower price, if patients can find it through maybe a TPA, maybe a health plan, um, can go ahead and get some bulk purchasing. Uh, if they can get it sent to us with good chain of custody, uh, we'll put it in the refrigerator and we'll infuse it at no drug cost, just our facility fee, which uh, pays for our nurses, our doctors, our monitors, our equipment um, right there. So uh, uh, the cost of those is... Uh, Fifteen hundred and six dollars, what uh, plus the cost of the medication, and uh, that's true if the medicine's five hundred dollars or fifty thousand uh, dollars. We aren't going to add anything additional on uh, beyond that drug cost, except for that same price. Many, uh, many may not realize that, but infusion. So you sit in the chair, and the drug gets put into your arm, right? Like over one, two, four, eight hours. I think there's variations, mm -hmm. um, but what happens there, typically the hospitals will charge a very fair rate for the actual time in the chair of the actual infusion. Uh, but what often happens is that they will take, say, and these drugs aren't cheap anyway, but let's say the drug, let's say it's in Tebo, and let's say it costs five or 6,000 for one, one, something like eight week, or let's, you know, once a month or whatever it may be, there's different schedules. But for one sitting in the chair, but they'll take, then they'll charge uh, twenty five thousand or more for the drug, and so they're. That's what Steve's talking about. They're not marking up the drug. In many cases, the under under programs, these hospitals uh, are getting these drugs for a penny, and they're still charging twenty five. So, talking about an employer plan or an employee a member of that plan getting ripped off, and so these are the kinds of games. Right. We just want people to be fair. We want them to be honest and we want fair prices. And and, and I, I even talked to an independent infusion oncology center once and they were working for a hospital and they had no idea the hospital was doing that. They thought they were making doing good and making a clean living and they charge fifteen hundred dollars for an infusion. And when we told them that the hospitals are doing that, they about fell out of their chair. In other words, they're like part of a part of a problem here. Um, they're part of a con conspiracy that really rakes people over the coals. So I mean, they weren't too happy about that. But but anyway, so that's that's where the money's made in infusion because no one knows what these drugs are supposed to cost and do cost. And so that's how they hide that. And the hospitals tried to monopolize that a couple of years ago. I testified in front of the Senate and we shut that down. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you for doing that, right? And you can still do well charging a fair price. Imagine that. Yeah, how about how about that? And we can feel we can feel good about it. We know people will come back. So that's right. Well, thanks again, Steve, for your heart. Thanks again, Steve um, and Josh as well for what you guys are doing. And let's uh, let's not feed the beast. Let's feed the ones mm -hmm. who are trying to help us and giving us fair prices. And that's key to this movement. So uh, if you want to, if you uh, want more services like that, always feel free to reach out to me, Matt at selffundhealth.com. I gain nothing from those things. I gain nothing from this. I gain nothing from these referrals. 
rather than uh, we're a health plan at Self Fund Health and we're helping employers find these services at fair prices. We oversee the health plan. But it's a thanks to many, many doctors in Wisconsin who are helping to drive the other side of this movement, the seller side of this movement. And it's our future. And it's uh, freedom, uh, medical freedom and autonomy are being threatened both for patient and doctor. And this is the way to fix it, folks. So thanks again for your time today. And uh, thank you again, Steve. Great. Thanks a lot, man.